I think uh, Finns uh, overall can't be very provocative, but um, but maybe just to say to begin with that uh, why do I comment on these things? So I'm gonna draw on on uh, on being an economist. So I have that nervousness that Miles said. So I'm just going to touch upon that. It's actually anxiety from my part concerning the sustainable development goals, uh, but. Um, I did uh, after I left the bank recently, um, as mentioned, and uh, one thing that I have done since during that time of uh, of having fun of not being a manager in the World Bank um, has been I've, I've done a report uh, for for the Finnish Parliament, uh, which is called Results on the Ground with the question mark, uh, which is an independent review of Finnish aid. So I think that is probably the reason that uh, Tony and and Finn um, invited me as a respondent. So I'm gonna comment from that pers those perspectives, sort of the uh, being an economist and thinking that way, and then uh, the experience partly in the bank, but mostly regarding uh, one bilateral donor, but then bringing in what has been said in these three presentations. So just first about the uh, sustainable development goals. And as I said, to me, they created anxiety because uh, MDGs is really something I lived with in, in the World Bank. And I can say that they were not initially, but quite soon taken as, taken as real goals and they shaped. So, they shaped behavior and action. So I would add, answer Richard M. saying that I, I, my experience was they really had an impact. They were goals. But I do think this conference gave me a good um, point. I mean, OK, Joe Stieglitz, my former boss, one remote, talked a long time. So people take various things from him. What I took from him, his uh, talk yesterday, actually the uh, question session, where he said that uh, uh, these sustainable development goals are norm setting. They are attitude changes. Then they come to countries and countries kind of reflect them in one way or, or another. I took that and I want to keep that because it totally lowers my anxiety because they are not the similar way the goals that you actually modify all your action as a development agency. And, and I think, um, yeah, Richard C., you brought this uh, from the climate change, um, you know, uh, literature or dialogue, that uh, concept, how, how you nationally choose your indicators and then measure. So then I'm, I'm much more at ease because otherwise there are just so many. And uh, I remember uh, having been again in the World Bank, I remember when the poverty reduction strategy papers, the PRSPs came and I had been on the, I was a Uganda economist my, in my first uh, uh, job in the bank, and the PRSB was really cooked up in Uganda, but it was nothing to do with PRSB. It was their own poverty program. There was never even a dream that it would come anything. When it became a PRSB, Ugandans already had their own poverty eradication action plan then, and they were done. But when PRSB came, the World Bank created the handbook for it, and it had 1,000 pages. And, and I mean, it was supposed to be about ownership. So the World Bank wrote 1,000 pages to say how it should be. So in a way, those memories kind of resonated when this, uh, this uh, SDGs have been discussed. But at the same time, even during this conference, there is a huge, strong, positive feeling. I mean, Yesterday, uh, the former president of Finland and, and uh, Joe Stiglitz, they said they are the d a deep form of democracy. Wow. So, so in a way, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, Joe mentioned that norm setting and then they will influence countries in various ways. Because had I been in charge, but I wasn't, and the whole country, all those countries will sign to them, then you sometimes think, because the chief economist of the U.S. Uh, aid said U.S. is big time into this. Now you mentioned China is big time into this. Who you start thinking maybe there's nothing in it because everybody can be big time in them. 
So had I been able to choose, just very briefly, I would say I, I believe that societies need to choose their own goals. I tend to believe that decentralization is better. Decentralized goals create better accountability, and there needs to be accountability lower level than just the whole globe. And perhaps uh, the third point about there uh, is that there is scarce effort internationally. It has now been made this very widest you can ever make it, all sectors, everything, and all countries. Another option would have been to focus on those global bads, let's say, like, fragile states, Syria, Middle East, Yemen, um, Afghanistan, things like conflict, for instance. So, so anyway, that's about um, what I wanted to say um, in terms of the SDGs. And then the aid policy. And uh, I, I think it was interesting uh, when uh, Richard uh, Manning said that multilateral, bilateral systems are not um, ready for that. I would like to ask, is China ready? Is, is that model much better? Um, kind of because uh, I, I mean the China thing is so super interesting. Um, and so is, uh, you could ask whether China is uh, readier. Also, perhaps on the China paper, I'm jumping a little bit, but uh, sort of uh, leaving the SDGs and kind of talking about the aid policy now. And, and trying to make the link to them and to your papers. I did, uh, I, uh, so China papers are interesting. I learned that the Chinese, from your paper, I learned that the Chinese actually learned the way of doing natural resource backed contracts from their own aid that they received from Japan. That was very interesting. The whole public entrepreneur thing is, of course, very interesting. I think one thing from your paper, obviously, I would love to see numbers. I am dying to see some of those numbers. Actually, what does this mean, especially for someone who has worked a lot in, in Africa? Um, then I was maybe the last kind of way of uh, framing these um, points is um, is how ready is then a country like Finland? So, um, okay, Richard Manning said it's an outlier. When I looked, it's an outlier maybe in the fastness of them cutting the aid program by 40%, like just like that. Um, and um, and in a way, when when I looked at uh, the aid program after 30 years. I had not looked at the Finnish aid program at all. When I looked at it, um, um, is um, they were not that the cutting was not yet there. Actually, la this uh, last year Finnish aid was was 0.6 uh, percent, so it's a, it was a considerable amount. But like uh, so, a few uh, points about that. So I tried to. That was a review. And I work with my former boss, Dean Adams, uh, to some degree uh, on it and myself a lot. But um, when, uh, when looking at it, um, the, the aid thing is, is a few kind of observations on that. The sustainable development goals, the, the leadership of, of the Finnish aid and, and, and in a small country, the UN is really important. UN is superbly important here in Finland. So all the leadership of, of the Finnish aid program were, were busy working on the sustainable development goals. That's for sure. And I would actually say that they probably spent far too much time on that. Because then when, when parliament says, hey, foreign office, we are not really quite confident with you in your reports because there is nothing negative. Everything is going smoothly. And, and there was quite a bit of swing in among parliamentarians, certain parties to, to be quite anti this thing. And then they say, OK, results. Where are the results? So when entering this aid program, small bilateral aid program, not a mini program, but relatively small, there is just hardly any evidence on results. So that was like the one observation that I had. And, and then you, well, 
how, how do you then deal with this massive SDG thing if you need to measure that? Uh, because the data problem is already very big with the MDGs in, in many countries. But most importantly, to bring the measurement and results to the policy. Uh, the, some of the other features uh, that I found was fast policy shifts, a lot of fragmentation, a lot of uh, wanting to address every agenda, and, um, and maybe a foreign office does that. But then that, were, that was especially from, um, um, uh, from the civil society support and multilateral support. And, um, and, and you want to be attending every area. I think the SDGs just enlarges probably that area a lot. Maybe the final point uh, uh, is, because my time is up, is to say that I see, based on, on particular this work on looking at the aid program, I am more and more seeing that aid will be very important in the so-called uh, fragile states. Aid, I, I got convinced during that process. And it's not only about the aid spending, but obviously the aid spending. Many of the, the Finns don't have to worry about the poor in Brazil. I, I buy that argument. Um, and um, and, and it's, it, one needs to move there, and the problems are really hard to tackle in those countries. So I, I think that's how I, I saw that um, thing. Maybe I, you are already, I'm over time, but there was one other issue that struck me a lot. There was so much talk about something called policy coherence. And, and I understand what it means. It means how does your trade policy affect, how does your agriculture policy affect, very important. But so very little concrete anything on that issue. It's like, to me, as a practical person, it's just talk. So that, um, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Invitva. And um, <laughs> I think, you know, your intervention was very, you know, provocative and very straightforward and, you know, clear message. Thank you so much. And uh, before opening the floor, I'd like to, uh, I have a request from the you know, uh, Korean delegation that uh, uh, Mr. Kim, president of COICA, would like to have a uh, you know, um, short intervention. And I'm not asking uh, Mr. Kim the um, kind of, you know, how are you going to you know, change, I mean, kind of rewrite the you know, aid policy in, within you know, COICA. But you have, you have the floor, please. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, among many other issues, uh, one of interesting uh, presentation is uh, China's role. Uh, of course, many are curious about what, how and Chinese are doing business. Uh, there are some critics say that uh, we don't know whether China is doing ODA or China is doing their own, pursuing their own strategic interest. And people are confused and uh, there have been a lot of opposition when AIB was uh, pronounced and then initiated. Uh, there were some views in the West that uh, China's role is very positive in terms of uh, helping and filling the gap. Uh, there were views that the Chinese uh, uh, increasing role is uh, threatening the pattern and, and morality of ODA uh, from the Western traditional point of view. Uh, we have seen the presentation with very careful interest by Kerry. And when you uh, describe that uh, creative destruction of uh, finance industry, uh, I would like to ask some more explanation why you, ex why you naming the Chinese role in financing in ODA or in um, their strategic um, network and entrepreneurship, whatever, why you are naming this creative destruction. Uh, that uh, we are very much interested. That would be the key point for us to collaborate with Chinese in, in the development work. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, President Kim, thank you very much for your, I know, comment and uh, uh, question to, uh, I think, uh, to Richard Carey, to Mr. Richard Carey. And I'd like to open the floor and please identify yourself and then, then you know, uh, make comments or you know questions as briefly as possible. And firstly, uh, maybe uh, Justin. Well, Justin Lin uh, from China, and you know, first I'd like to comment on these three presentation and also the discussion for a very good uh, you know framework to understand the issue of. ODAs and uh, foreign aid and so on, and also especially uh, Richard Carey, uh, his presentation had a very good summary of you know the thinking and the policy and the evolution in China. And I have one comments and one question. One comments may be related to Mr. Kim's uh, comments on China's foreign policies. From what I see, the purpose of AIDS is to improve the well-being of the recipients. And uh, no matter how you achieve that, what's the purpose that you give AIDS? It can be political, it can be humanitarian, and it can be commercial. But at the end, the judgment will be whether you really improve the well-being of the people. And if you forget that, then the ace may not serve the purpose. It may be just, you know, talking, or it may be just serving the purpose of the donors instead of the recipients. And in that regard, yes, today, a lot of age in China is in a firm of some kind of commercial arrangement, certainly with some kind of concession. But here that, as long as it serves the purpose, it should be welcome. That's my, you know, comments, and I certainly like to have your reaction from the panel, whether that is a good criterion or not. That's one thing. And secondly, in terms of SDG, MDG, and so on, there are many goals. But should we give some kind of priorities to give on goals? Fundamentally, it's to improve the well-being of the people. And to improve the well-being of the people, I think we need to make the development inclusive. And uh, if we want to have an inclusive growth, to create jobs would be the most important way. And so should we discuss the things around in, you know, we have different goals and we put some kind of ranking and to see how they directly link to the job. If they do not direct into the creating of the jobs, then they should be given low rank. And uh, if they can directly link to the given, you know, creating job, they should receive higher ranks. Otherwise, we know resources is limited in any country. No matter it's donors of money or the budget in the recipient country. And if we do not have some kind of priorities, they may be pursuing too many things at the end, nothing achieved. So that's my comment. I'd also like to have the, you know, response from the panels. Okay, thank you. And, uh, Graciana del Castillo from the City University of New York. Uh, thank you very much for very interesting presentations and your comments. And I work in countries coming out of war or other crises, and I found Richard Manning a, a graph on the low-income countries very interesting because the average aid in those countries is 10%. Some of the countries I work with, you know, the average aid in the first decade after the crisis goes higher than 50%. So it's, the situation is very different. And it's the, what I have observed in that uh, is that the, the way aid and foreign investment and, and remittances and all that has taken a, a completely different uh, turn from what it used to be. For instance, in, in Afghanistan, the, the issue of the largest untapped copper mine. Uh, you know, in Latin America, we discussed the, how the foreign direct investment package was unpackaged in the 80s and 90s and so forth. Here, the situation is very interesting because China, for instance, they packed 
they, whole, they have a whole package that includes aid, it includes uh, security, and it brings um, a foreign direct investment all together in the same package. So it's very really hard, for instance, for the, for the Canadian firms or the American firms or the European firms to come and compete because these countries provide the aid and the security separate from the foreign investors. So, so this is something, I mean, I don't have an opinion of whether it's better or not, but it's something that has changed the landscape in these countries. With regards to the Millennium Development Goals, uh, my experience in these countries is that many times they divert. I think we heard how, for instance, unemployment was not a big issue in the Millennium Development Goals. And what I have seen is that many of these goals have divert, diverted resources from employment, which is what you need in these countries, towards some of these goals. I'm not saying the goals are not uh, important, but I'm saying sometimes they diverted resources from really uh, sectors and, and areas in which there was a, a large need for aid. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, gentleman over there, please. Thank you. Uh, Stine Anderson from the NIDA. Um, and thank you very much to the excellent panel for, panel for a very, very good overview. Um, I think my question is for uh, Richard Manning. Now, um, talking about, we've talked about the, the post 2015 agenda, and now we've had all of these different factors creative destruction, a plethora perhaps of development banks, et cetera, more bilateral drives rather than multilateral with, with various donors. So, Richard, do you have in your head, or could you sketch out, you know, what is the post 2015 model then of? funding flows, if you will, concessional and semi-concessional flows in the future that might have a chance of actually delivering to the SDGs, especially in, in low-income countries. Um, I hope you want to share it with us. And, and of course, with some degree of realism, I mean, can we hope to achieve that? Because we could probably sketch an ideal model, but with, you know, with your knowledge of all of these different trends, etc., you know, what's, what can we hope for? Thank you. Okay, thank you. A very challenging uh, question, I'll be. But uh, I don't like to, you know, uh, you know, compete with your, you know, lunchtime. But uh, we have some, you know, uh, hands over there. So please, you know, way over there. Uh, the, the last row. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Daryl Sequera, an environmental ecologist based in Finland. Um, I'm sorry for the confusion in my mind, which might be very simple for to an economist, which is um, we say we use the term aid, aid policy, but I'm not clear in my mind where we separate the 0.7 percent that governments have pledged to give as aid from the total amount that's given. Uh, as aid, which we, we seem to be calling aid, which to my mind seems to be commercially oriented investment, either soft loans or hard loans, but loans. So where do we exactly draw the line? And where do we consider what is humanitarian and what uh, uh, of that humanitarian investment can be given as a commercial investment? Those are questions that arise in my mind. Uh, and adding to that is very often we find that these so-called um, uh, aid packages are actually tied to uh, exploitation of the natural resources in the recipient countries. So that's actually very, very profit-oriented, and it might not be efficient in terms of raising the well-being of the local population, but more raising the well-being of the donor agency. So those are the, th the questions that arise in my mind. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, that the next, uh, you know, next to the gentleman. Yes. Hi, I'm Michael Barwitz. I'm the chief economist from the Global Fund. Um, so first of all, it's interesting not to hear any discussion about private philanthropy like the Gates Foundation, um, who not only provide direct aid transfers, but also have huge influence on the multilateral system. They're now one of the largest donors, for example, to the World Health Organization, have huge influence over the multilateral system. And I haven't heard anybody even mention them. In fact, I think they're actually more currently more influential than China. Um, and the second thing, having worked in a lot of countries, including China, I, I think 
the issue around aid transfer is not just about giving money to poor countries, it's also about knowledge and technical assistance. Um, and I think that discussion has been left out of this because I think particularly for middle income countries, they, they have a lot to learn from OECD countries and how that's organized um, to try to address some of the challenges that they face that have already been addressed by some of the developed countries is something I think that's really weak in the international architecture um, and that the international system is not well organized to provide. Thank you. And the, the last, uh, you know, Hello, Oliver Morris, the University of Nottingham. Uh, it's a comment that, from your combined experience, any of the three of you could respond to. Um, in many respects, China's approach to aid is very similar to the traditional donors' tied aid practices that I'm sure you all remember uh, from the 1980s uh, and earlier. And I can I remember well the economists, NGOs, politicians, and I know it was within the DAC, um, the kind of the buildup of persuasive arguments that tied aid was not the right way to deliver aid. Should we be going back to those arguments and subjecting Chinese aid to that type of analysis that many of us did in the 1980s? Okay, thank you very much all, and uh, well, the basic thing is uh, it is very hard to respond to, you know, simple questions, but uh, we will try. I would I like to ask speakers to uh, respond uh, maybe two minutes each, and uh, well, please, you know, in order. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll have a crack at perhaps the easier ones and leave the difficult ones for my colleagues to answer. Um, f first of all, on, on, on Justin's que question about job creation and decent work, um, uh, when I was speaking, I mentioned that the, the arrival at these sustainable development goals had been a very consultative process. Uh, and it was very interesting that after health and education, which came at the top of the list, as you would expect, what people said, which came into third position, was decent work and jobs uh, in the surveys that were done around what um, civil society wanted uh, out of these sustainable development goals. And if you think about it, that's not surprising because uh, younger people leaving school, un leaving university, clearly need jobs. But also people at the other end of the employment scale, people who are uh, into their 50s and, and 60s where there's no social protection scheme, where, they, where there's no retirement funding for them, they need to be able to keep uh, working. So I think it's, it's unsurprising that um, um, uh, decent work and jobs should feature so strongly in these sustainable development goals. Um, and my assumption is that now um, in individual countries will reflect those sustainable development goals in their plans going forward. So for example, in Ethiopia, uh, their new growth and transformation program has a lot to say about job creation, uh, uh, em employment creation, uh, etc. And I think that um, you know that whole that, that your point with which I completely agree is that is that aid should basically be to support uh, the well-being of recipients. Y you can't just go in and do it as you as you as you know as well as me. You know you have to get behind a strategy that's there, and you have to support what uh, what what governments themselves um, are, are saying. Um, just a couple of, of kind of random comments on, on, uh, on other points, uh, perhaps. Um, uh, we didn't say anything about private foundations. That's, that's absolutely right. Uh, they ha have become increasingly significant, particularly over the last 10 or 15 years. And it's not just the Gateses and, and others. Um, private foundations within Africa, within India, within, within other parts of Asia, of, of Asia uh, their roles uh, as well have become uh, increasingly significant and I think that's that's really important and uh, I also agree with the comment about we should be um, creating partnerships actually technical assistance partnerships uh, where the flow is not just one way actually this is not just a north-south flow I think there's an awful lot uh, that the north has to learn from the from the south through the development of some of these these uh, these partnerships 
And the final point, uh, perhaps for me, just to comment on about this, this, this tired aid. Yes, I mean, I do, I do think you're absolutely right that um, we, we have gone back to that uh, discussion and debate. But I think um, Chinese aid being tied is not as potentially distorting as Northern aid was distorting. And, and Richard and I uh, dealt with this quite a lot back in, in, in the 1980s, where the distortions were huge, frankly. I think that where, um, where goods and services are produced at much lower cost, then the differential uh, and therefore the skewing that you get through tying aid would, would, be, would be smaller. But we've certainly got to keep it in our sights, I think. Okay, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, some quick comments. So just on one point that Ritva raised, she quite rightly referred to policy coherence. And we all fallen down on this. And I think the area we need to focus on particularly is let, these days less trade than tax. I think that's a very important agenda in that area. Uh, Justin asked about what are the priorities within all this. And I think that my answer to him and also to our Danish colleague, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to give you the answer of the world in 30 seconds, but things have to make sense at the level of the recipient country. And as I said, if you're a middle-income country, aid is fairly small. You can cope with money that is targeted for one particular purpose that's important to the donor. If you're a very poor country and aid is 50% of your GNI or whatever, you can't do that. And that's where, and this, I appreciate the way the Global Fund, for example, is now looking at what it does more in the context of what's going on in the health sector generally. That's entirely the right approach. So we have to listen very carefully to our recipient countries, the, the implemented countries, and overall, we mustn't distort their priorities. Otherwise, you don't get ownership and you don't get results. You know, if Finland wants results, donors should be clear about what they want to achieve, but these achievements are not going to be theirs. These are achievements of the countries. And donors have to sell to their publics that we are co-investors in, let's say, improving the quality of female education in Bangladesh. And we don't have to prove that we, Finland, did exactly this within that. Attribution gets ridiculous at some point. You've got to be a contributor to an overall process within which you're comfortable with what you're doing, and the thing makes sense in the point of view of the recipient country. And when you think of what's the model for development assistance in the, the SDGs, the, the point I would put to you is, <coughs> what's going to make sense for Malawi or a country like that? What, what kind of mix of, of, of special purpose funds, general funds, loans, grants, makes sense at the point of that country? And we could have a long discussion about how to do that, as I used to say in the DAC, if you visited the world from Mars, you would wonder why Earthlings made it so complicated to do something on which they all agree. Everybody agrees we need sustainable development. We've now got the SDGs to, to measure this. Uh, why can't we find some better ways of doing this? I think that what I've learned in my experience of trying to do this is that donors will not achieve this. It's the recipient countries, the implementing countries, who have to lead the process. And I think we have to turn the telescope around, look at it from that point of view. Um, I do think there are issues around this whole tide aid issue. Uh, as I've said already, I was not a fan of this uh, using aid to win contracts approach that uh, I and others were involved in doing in the 1980s. And I think that the two things that work against that are, first of all, obviously tide aid is less of a problem if you're internationally competitive. And China does have some international competitive process itself, which helps to keep the cost down. So. You know, maybe from that point of view, it's not so bad. But I worry in the Chinese case, as I worried in the British case, that companies get too powerful in all this. They have their own reasons to get to point A. And they will talk to the operating agencies in the recipient country. They will cook up a proposition. They will flog it to the Ministry of Finance on the one side and the aid donor on the other side. This proposition will get through, even if it's not the best thing to do. If loan money is involved, that could be a thoroughly bad decision. So again, it's the recipient country the finance people, the people at the center have to be empowered to fight against people in operating institutions who have their own reasons to push particular things. A link to that, I was the first DAC chair to visit China. And the two things I came away from, I was very, I very much admire a lot of what China is doing. The two things that China needs to think about are two words. One is sustainability. If you put in a lot of capital investment, will it be maintained? And secondly, transparency. Can people see what you're doing? And I think particularly in these natural resource-linked exploitations, I think China needs to think about both those things quite carefully. Uh, and finally, technical assistance and knowledge. Michael's quite right about that. I learned a lesson when I was at the DAC, which was that I didn't know much about the OECD. I knew quite a lot about the DAC. But I think the OECD is actually a fabulous institution. It's a great collection of people in the OECD countries 
who are focused on the same issue, are struggling with the same problems, and want to learn from each other. And what we need, and the OECD is gradually itself pushing in this direction, we need a properly organized international results, uh, lesson learning transfer system, and OECD type bringing together the stakeholders who know about the environment and how you manage waste, uh, you know, all these, all these issues we're all struggling with. Uh, the problem is it's difficult to do that with 180 countries. It's already proved quite difficult to do it with, with 30 or so. But I think we need more intelligent models of how to do that across the world. And of course, it's not just learning from the OECD countries. There's huge learning to be done from China, from India, from all sorts of countries. And we need to push all that. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> well, uh, Ritva, is China ready for the SDGs? Uh, well, uh, Xi Jinping will be in New York on 28th of this month. His speech, I think, will be really quite fascinating here. Given the number of Chinese initiatives that I was uh, showing up on the slide there, how, how will he put that whole story together? Now, what, what China is bringing, in my view, very fundamentally, is the transformation idea. It's bringing the Lewis model. It's bringing a, a model that will generate jobs, will generate trade and investment and jobs, employment a dynamic economic process which will bring well-being to millions of people over this period of 15 years. So China is bringing that ambition to the table. Nobody else really is bringing that ambition. So um, China is, uh, because it's becoming a bigger part of the whole uh, global economy of the development business, it acquires an interest in performance and, and in the effective development process. So it's moving way, way away from its uh, support of liberation movements. It it's wants now to support performing governments. It's dealing with some very risky cases, Zimbabwe and Venezuela. So it's in different kinds of discussions with them. The whole non-interference principle is, in practice, it's being modified quite uh, significantly. So um, that I, is my, uh, my, my, my take on that. Uh, what are the numbers? Yeah, well, uh, you can look up various websites, <laughs> but there's a very big uh, discussion between people who are trying to estimate these numbers, um, aid data based at William & Mary sending up satellites to look for Chinese projects from satellites, oh. <laughs> uh, et cetera. Uh, but I can direct you uh, to some of these numbers. The numbers I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying the numbers because in the um, sort of group that I work with, we, we sort of agree not to mention these numbers because the headline numbers are often very wrong and uh, we, we spread you know, misunderstandings. Uh, but what I should say about Chinese aid packages, these resource uh, um, for infrastructure packages, what China is doing is attaching the the uh, repayment of the loans to the uh, resource receipts as they come through, but the actual package discovers, uh, uh, covers a whole wide range of activities in infrastructure, social development, and so forth. It's not just the resources. China is organizing its supply chains. That's what it's been doing, but it's doing it through these diversified economic packages. When you look inside them, you'll see development packages. Uh, now, what the other thing that China is saying as it's creating these new regional initiatives, you know, we want to work with other people. So that's the a question that was asked. You know, here are these Chinese packages. How can we be part of it? It's difficult to be part of them. China is now saying we want to work with others. So that's, uh, you know, that's the frontier for the, the next uh, few years. And it's not, uh, not um, uh, going to be totally straightforward, but it's a new, it's a new uh, approach. So um, on uh, uh, Koika uh, dis discussion, that, that's what I would say, that China is now saying we want to work with you. And uh, that's uh, the, whether China's aid is on its own interests or uh, is it aid, is it a welfare transfer, they have got a trade and investment and aid model. And trade and investment generate mutual benefits. That's how we all operate. 
So that's and what that's what China is trying to do is trying to develop the, the, those those dynamic economic processes. Um, on uh, the question of um, the, from the Global Fund uh, and uh, the Gates Foundation, I'm actually working on a Gates Foundation project at the moment, and I, I think the Gates Foundation done a fantastic job, and I would say that they are also a global public entrepreneur. They're doing a lot of things to bring uh, issues together and, and uh, find answers, engage people. Um, on the uh, on back coming back to these Chinese tight aid packages and uh, whether we should go back to the um, the arguments that we went through earlier, um, Oliver read our paper in the Journal of International Development last month because that's what we uh, we went back and uh, and uh, did. I'm absolutely um, uh, online with uh, Richard Manning that for China sustainability and transparency are two uh, big uh, frontiers and. Uh, really uh, important for them to address uh, in everybody's interest, but their own in particular, because building up unsustainable um, uh, loan portfolios, not in their interests, and uh, transparency, if you want to work with others, you have to be more transparent. So these, are, uh, I think, are there. China and the OECD uh, is, uh, have just signed an, a memorandum of understanding. Uh, why? Because China wants to learn from the OECD and it wants to learn about things like integrity and uh, climate change and uh, uh, um, environmental standards. And uh, uh, Richard, at the IDS, in our Rising Powers in Development program, we are trying to promote this learning between uh, emerging countries and other developing countries and, uh, and OECD countries as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, I think, you know, Last has response. Two, two, two messages. <laughs> <laughs> what did I learn on, on this? So, and l trying to look into the future on the basis of this and maybe the, the other experience I've had. So, let me say this. Looks like China will change the aid industry and aid finance. And hopefully China will change according to those sustainability and transparency rules so that China changes others and changes itself as well. I think that would be very good and look, could happen. Uh, I think that's really very good because I do think countries do want business collaboration. They do want, um, they do want like I, again, coming from Finland, what do they want to do with the little country Finland? technology, technology-related things. That's very good, because I do think we need some of those other instruments, not just the grants. Grants should go to the poorest countries and especially fragile states. And then one needs to go forward and think how to deal with that issue of knowledge. Because if you just become a poor a country like uh, agency, the knowledge thing doesn't flow. So I didn't learn during this seminar, it remains as a question, how to then do that knowledge exchange. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, before closing, um, Miles, uh, you know, signaled me one question is not answered. Uh, just, just 20 seconds, because I don't think we've answered the point about the 0 0.7 and, and uh, how much of that will, will go towards climate change, environment, etc. I mean, my assumption is that over the next 15 years, um, there will be less aid spent on bilateral programs, and that will focus very much on the fragile states. An increasing proportion of aid will go to support global public goods, including climate change and environmental issues. But clearly, we don't want all aid to be spent to support environment and, and, and climate change issues. More than that, I think it's quite difficult to, to parcel it up at this stage. OK, thank you, Miles, and uh, everyone. Uh, development aid policymakers, I believe, right now, they face, well, you know, they have opportunities, but they face a lot of challenges. And policymaking needs evidences based on the robust research. And in this way, we count on new UNU wider members, and we, we really count on you. And we need, you know, a lot of evidences, you know, to support new, I mean, kind of, you know, revision of policies. And we had a wonderful panel, marvelous speakers and respondents. 
And please join me in applause to wonderful panel. Thank you so much.